you. Our presenter today is Nancy A. Rogat. She's the Executive Director of the Center for the Application of Substance Abuse Technologies at the University of Nevada, Reno, a grant-funded organization providing training and technical assistance in substance abuse prevention, treatment, and recovery with an annual budget of over $4 million. She is the project director for several federal, CDC and SAMHSA, and state grants. Recently, she was awarded the National Frontier and Rural ATTC grant with a focus on telehealth technologies. During her tenure, she has created innovative initiatives, including an online minor in addiction counseling and prevention services. Previously, she directed community-based substance abuse treatment programs for adolescents and their family members for 14 years. She has written training manuals and peer-reviewed journal articles. Ms. Rogat has developed her entire professional career of 36 years to the substance abuse treatment profession, working as a counselor, treatment coordinator, executive director, trainer, lecturer, project manager, and principal investigator. All right, Nancy, if you're ready, I will hand things over to you. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, are my slides showing? Yes, they are. Okay, great. You know, we're doing a talk on technology, and I have to make sure the technology is working well. So. Thank you for this opportunity today. Um, I'm very excited to talk about this topic of uh, technology-based interventions and effort. Um, and Crystal spent a lot of time introducing, my, introducing me, so I won't spend much time on that at all. I can tell you we're one of the addiction, tech, addiction technology transfer centers, and you can see here on the slide the purpose of the ATTCs is to strengthen is to develop and strengthen the workforce that provides addictions treatment and recovery support services to those in need. Um, hopefully you're aware of your regional addiction, tech, addiction technology transfer centers, and, um, but if you're not, here's a map that shows the different regions. There are 10 regional centers, uh, and they are aligned with the HHS regions. We also have a national uh, network coordinating center. Um, and then we have uh, four national focus area ATPCs. And our colleagues from the National Expert ATPC are sponsoring this event, and they're located in Pittsburgh uh, with their uh, member organization or their member agency being IRETA. There's the National Hispanic and Latino ATPC located in Puerto Rico, the National American Indian Alaska Native ATPC at the University of Iowa, and then we're the National Frontier and Rural ATPC located at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, let me just give you sort of the underpinnings of our uh, goal, or one of our main goals for the National Frontier and Rural ATPC. And that is to serve as the national subject expert and key resource to promote the awareness and implementation of telehealth technology. And that's why uh, the National Expert ATPC asked us to speak today. Um, the goal of this particular webinar is to expose practitioners to technology-based interventions related to screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. And the next slide shows you what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so here's our outline. Uh, I'm going to go over pretty quickly the prevalence of use of technology uh, in behavioral health uh, by clients and practitioners, the definition of technology-based interventions, uh, workforce, organizations, and patients use the use of technology. Um, and then we're going to talk about research-based technologies for effort. And these are specific studies that have been done testing out uh, using different types of technologies to deliver screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. I'll have a summary statement at the end and then resources. And as Crystal said, certainly you can type questions 
in uh, to the question box, and Crystal and I, as we go along, will stop and answer questions as well. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic today, and I think when you look at technology-based interventions, there's some really interesting things happening in regards to effort. So, let's get started. Um, I'm going to read you this quote, uh, and the quote was done in 1998, and it says, the successful practitioner of the next century will need to master technologies in order to effectively manage the care of patients. Just like the microscope allowed practitioners in the early era to see micro uh, agents of infection, the computer will also change the patient. And what we're talking about here is that uh, folks really believe that technology is going to have a huge impact on healthcare. And these folks said this in 1998, and I, and I think now in 2016 we can certainly see that that's true. And so when patients arrive at our, our agencies or at our clinics, we really may see healthcare professionals serving more as a role of counselor or consultant and helping people manage, because uh, patients are going to be managing their own care with the help of technology. Uh, so certainly we know people are using technology. I suggest to you that you just go to any kind of a uh, place where people are waiting, whether it's at a restaurant or at some kind of sporting event or public transportation or at the airport and everybody's got their phone out looking at their phone, uh, checking messages, talking with folks, texting uh, or using the phone. So certainly people are using technology. And what we're seeing as well is online and mobile technologies is really ubiquitous uh, across age. So uh, before, we'd see mostly uh, technology, online and mobile technologies being used by uh, younger folks, adolescents, uh, but really we're seeing uh, everybody starting to use technology, no matter people's age, their race, their ethnicity, or their geography. And increasingly, really, consumers are relying on the internet and smartphone-based tools for health information and tracking. And just ask some of your clients or patients, um, have they ever looked up uh, like recovery support services online or online support groups or uh, have they Googled different health conditions? And you'll find that a lot have. One of the things I like to notice uh, when I'm out is how many people are wearing some kind of tracker like an exercise or step tracker uh, like a Fitbit. And you'll be surprised to see how many people are wearing are actually monitoring their health that way. A great statistic is in 2013, uh, this just kind of blew me away, 1.91 trillion text messages were sent in the United States. Now, I would say my son accounted for some of those. Um, I'm sure not uh, a trillion, but um, many of those text messages. Although I will tell you we're starting to see a trend with uh, adolescents and young adults using uh, more of a picture uh, chat version like Snapchat or uh, Instagram or some of those social media uh, sites. And then you can see 8 trillion text messages were sent worldwide. So, so the message here is that technology and the use of mobile phones certainly is, is prevalent in the world. There's some really interesting studies going on now that support the efficacy of texting with other chronic conditions like obesity, diabetes, asthma, tobacco dependence, and sexual health. And we're just starting to see studies appear of using texting uh, with substance use disorders. And I'll be talking about one of those today, uh, sort of the I in ESPER. Um, now, here's the definition uh, for technology-based interventions. So it's the use of technology devices to deliver some aspect of assessment, intervention, treatment, or recovery services, or recovery support services directly to patients via interaction with a web-based program and or mobile device. Now, this was a definition uh, coming out of an article by Kathy Carroll uh, and her colleague in 2010. And I played around with the definition a little bit because back in 2010, it said uh, 
instead of web-based, it said a computer. And we're really starting to see that everything is either web-based or uh, mobile phone-based uh, when we're talking about uh, people using um, technology to provide services or support. So technology-based interventions have the ability to lower consumer threshold for initiation of treatment and refer at-risk individuals to in-person treatment. What this really talks about here, it's a great article, is that um, technology is allowing folks to go in and do some self-assessments, to, to go online and do some self-assessments, to get some feedback, um, and a lot of times these programs are able to provide personalized feedback and make recommendations for treatment. You now have people who are able to go online and, and find support groups or listen to podcasts. Um, to help them enter treatment because we still have a huge problem of, of the majority of people with substance use disorders are not receiving treatment services. Um, technology assisted care interventions as well, they can serve as adjuncts to standardized to standard treatment. They can really save clinician time. They can uh, extend clinician expertise. Uh, so instead of, this is an example, so instead of a clinician spending time going over uh, drug refusal skills or how to deal with drug cravings and how to manage those, they could have the patient log in to a web-based program uh, and a module where they sat through and they got to hear about drug cravings and they got to practice how to manage those uh, while the clinician is maybe dealing with another patient who's in a crisis situation. Also, uh, technology-assisted care uh, affords the opportunity to integrate uh, evidence-based practices into uh, additional services, and that would be especially helpful for clients with comorbid conditions, and then provide access to web-based smoking cessation programs or other health-related conditions. So you could have at your treatment facility a web-based uh, series of modules on uh, smoking cessation, cessation that you could have uh, clients who uh, are tobacco dependent could log in and do uh, that uh, training and education and start their uh, quitting process while they're in treatment with you. So there's lots of different things that are available now and that would enhance treatment services. Um, there's great evidence suggesting real positive treat, treatment outcomes when you add uh, technology-based interventions to your uh, traditional treatment services. Um, and also what we're looking at is that technology has the potential to really narrow this access gap to behavioral health interventions and reduce health disparities in disadvantaging hard-to-reach populations. Certainly when we look at uh, patients who live in rural and remote areas, many uh, broadband is certainly, access to broadband has certainly increased. And one of the things we're looking at is that if folks uh, can uh, uh, access the web, they can participate in online Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous support groups. They can download and listen to podcasts. Anything that's going to enhance their treatment services or their treatment rather than having to drive uh, two hours for an appointment. So we're really looking at technology helping to do two things. Expand um, uh, access to treatment and enhance our current services. So think of it in that manner. Expand access and then enhance our current treatment services. Um, so now I'm going to move into talking about the workforce and technology issues. And certainly we can see use of technologies uh, by clinicians is increasing. And it presents sometimes unique and uh, clinical and business dilemmas. Uh, sometimes we have folks who are uh, in favor of using technology in uh, treatment services. And we have folks that are totally against it, do not believe in it. Um, and the folks that are in favor of it, 
sometimes will, with the ease uh, in use of technology, will sometimes jump in and use technology with particular patients without thinking about the HIPAA privacy and security issues along with confidenti uh, along with 42 CFR Part 2, the federal confidentiality rules and regulations. Um, when we look at the digital divide, I look at this particular digital divide in a different way. I'm not talking about people who don't have access or patients that don't have access to broadband. We're really talking about the digital divide in our own work in our own workforce. We certainly have uh, counselors, therapists, nurses, social workers, marriage and family therapists, psychologists, um, other health prof healthcare professionals. Um, physician's assistants um, who are like, mm, no, I don't believe in technology. I don't believe it. we should be using it to help our clients. Um, I think face-to-face -face services are the best. And then we have other people on the other side. Then we have clients on the other side going, hey, wait a minute. Um, this is what I'm used to. It's what I'm used to using. I want you to provide services. And one of the questions I always ask folks are, you know, do you, as a person who has health insurance, do, does your health insurance or does your physician have a, a, a web-based portal that you can log into and send messages to your doctor, make appointments, get test results? And if you do, when I ask that question when we're speaking uh, publicly at workshops, um, people who have access to this love it. And so we have to think about what our patients want. There's an interesting study that was done through the VA. And the VA has a PTSD app um, that's used in the treatment with vets. And one of the things they found is that the younger clinicians and those, and those clinicians with smartphones found the app more usable than older clinicians or those without uh, smartphones. And that these variables really predicted whether the clinicians were going to use the, the PTSD app in the treatment uh, of the clients that they were serving. That's a recent interesting study. Um, and here's just a comic. Uh, you can see here it says, in every office there's always someone who didn't get the message. And you can see there's an old typewriter, an old adding machine, an old telephone. And certainly we have folks who um, are a little bit uh, resistant to technology or a little worried about technology or certainly not as open to the use of technology to do their job. Um, when we look at organizations, um, there's some recent uh, research that's been done uh, looking at their uh, adoption of technology-based interventions. And one of the things they found is that this was a recent study by uh, Ramsey, um, that agencies with an operating budget of greater than 10 million um, reported significantly fewer barriers in uh, uh, implementing technology-based interventions. And uh, so the bigger the agencies were, uh, or the bigger the agencies with a bigger budget had less trouble implementing technology-based interventions rather than smaller agencies. It was also true that agencies serving more than 3,000 clients per year reported significantly fewer implementation barriers than those serving less clients. And you may say to yourself, well, why is that? Part of the uh, issue has to do with it seems like agencies that are bigger and have uh, bigger budgets and serve more clients are used to making more changes. They may have uh, more revenue around to provide additional training to their staff. Um, and they just may be more used to uh, being innovative and uh, making changes more quickly. Um, this study went on to say that a lot of times provider resistance and lack of openness to use technology-based uh, care approaches could be, there could be a lot of reasons for it. So sometimes uh, there's limited awareness of established benefits of using technology-based interventions. There's an organizational climate that's characterized by skepticism or unwillingness to try new approaches. And there's also um, people are going, well, we need to see more research on effectiveness and safety of these tools before we implement them. Um, also, uh, a lot of the providers in this particular study said that um, they lack the basic knowledge about how these technologies can be used 
uh, for behavioral health care. So that brings in the issue of training. I'll talk about that in a minute. So one of the biggest things is how will technologies change how the provider does business? And it, this is a cartoon that says, oh, I guess we should, I'll, I suppose I'll be, in the one, I'll be the one to mention the elephant in the room. Because using technologies does change how you do business and for the good, and maybe it has some negative effects as well. So here's some other findings and recommendations regarding staff. Most important thing, and this is whether you're looking at any kind of innovation, not just necessarily in the behavioral health field, but the fit of any innovation, uh, there's got to be a fit. And it's got to fit with the attitudes. Uh, uh, the innovation has to fit with the attitudes and values of the agency and providers adopting it. And it's, that is really critical, because if there's not a good fit, then what, we're, what you're impacting on a negative, uh, in a negative way is the acceptability, the uh, efficiency, and effectiveness of the implementation process. So the innovation's got to fit. Now when we talk about fit, what do we mean? Well, okay, you're, uh, we're going to adopt this new innovation. Is it better and is it easier than what I'm currently using or doing? That's one of the biggest questions we have to, when we're looking at agencies and adoption rate of uh, new innovations, is when you go to staff, you go, hey, I'm really used to doing this one thing, and now you're going to ask me to, do, to use something new. And is it better than what I'm currently using? And can I learn to, to use it correctly pretty easily? If not, you're going to uh, have trouble with people uh, using the new technology. Um, and, and just think about it for a minute. Let me go back to this slide. Just think about it for a minute like when, when there's an upgrade in PowerPoint or there's an upgrade in Word and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I just got used to where all the icons are and how to use them and how to save stuff. And, and when, when we have those changes, it really impacts folks. And so we need to make sure that if we're of whatever innovation technology-based intervention we're adopting, we have to make sure that it's easy to use and that it's better than what we're currently doing. Otherwise, there will be a great struggle with implementation. Also, uh, integration uh, requires understanding of staff members' degree of comfort with technology. You know, my staff kind of uses uh, me as the guinea pig, like, well, if Nancy can do it and she can use it, then probably anyone else on staff can use it. And then what's the time burden for you uh, learning to use this new in, uh, innovation? And then you have to make sure that you select uh, training and to help increase staff confidence in navigating the sort of foreign technology. So it's really important that professionals understand, you know, the ability of technology to reach enormous numbers of people and that the use of technology for treatment and recovery support and uh, offers the possibility of better care, reduced stigma, and broader reach. All right. So a lot of folks say to me, hmm, but what about patients? Do patients uh, like technology? Okay. And so let's talk about patients' acceptability of technology. Um, really, what we're finding is that people with common health concerns find each other by websites, blog search engines, and through mobile apps and Twitter tags. People are already going online that have, a, that have a particular condition, and they'll find each other. They'll find information. Uh, they'll find support groups. Um, and so a lot of patients are already uh, searching the web and other kinds of technology-based interventions to help them deal with a certain condition. Um, what do we know particularly about uh, SUD patients? This was a survey done uh, in eight urban drug treatment clinics in Baltimore with about 266 patients. This was done in 2012, and they found that their clients had access to mobile phones, 90, over 90 percent, uh, text messaging almost 80 percent, and less access to internet, email, and computer. Uh, most of the mobile phone access was uh, mobile phones that were um, uh, 
that you could buy sort of throwaway uh, mobile phones um, and that uh, uh, providers had trouble keeping track of the client's uh, phone number sometimes when they're using these disposable or tracked phones. Um, another study uh, repeated what McCure, McCure, McCure and folks found. Uh, this was done in 2015, and you can see that 61.3% of patients utilize mobile apps, so this is up a little bit, and two other things they found, that younger patients uh, were mo more likely to utilize technology, including smartphones and mobile apps, and certainly one of the reasons um, the younger you are, it's a higher risk factor for dropping out of substance abuse treatment. So the indication is that mobile apps um, and online uh, kind of uh, support groups um, or educational uh, modules may be well suited for addressing uh, treatment needs and helping keep uh, younger patients uh, in treatment. So. Also, uh, recent evidence, several studies uh, that clients are uh, used to and interested in using technology so as part of their treatment or continuing support. This is also true for doing screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment as well. And what I talk about here is customer demand. And I think um, our uh, treatment providers um, are going to have to be prepared for clients going, hey, do you have anything after hours? Do you have uh, a module or a website that I can log into and that I can connect with other people who are in treatment so I can have support 24-7? I think we're, uh, providers are going to have to start uh, looking at this because pe customers are interested in using different uh, web-based technology or mobile phone-based uh, technologies to help them with their particular condition. I don't know, Crystal, do we have any questions yet um, before I move on? Hi, Nancy. At this time, we don't have any questions. I just want to remind our attendees that they can send those via the questions box or the chat box. Actually, we just had one come in. Um, someone would like to know, would you share the client questionnaire to determine tech use? Yes, I will. I'll be able to send that out. Okay. And then another question um, we've had is, how does texting relate to HIPAA concerns? Well, there are, um, there are texting when uh, when I'm talking about texting, I'm not uh, talking about texting uh, clients using your own work or personal uh, cell phone. There are uh, SMS texting programs that providers can purchase um, and that allow providers to send messages to clients um, and uh, to be able to um, help clients uh, access services, um, but these and um, some of these programs are ready for prime time and some are not. Um, but uh, and we have difficulty being able to promote different texting programs. But what you want to look for are uh, texting programs that protect. Uh, clients' confidentiality and uh, their privacy and security issues. Um, when I talk about a texting program for SBIRT uh, done by a researcher out of Pittsburgh, um, there is now a company that's been created based on the results of his particular study, and I'll be able to show you that as well. All right, Nancy, we've had another question come in, which is, could you please explain more on how utilizing technology in treatment would help to reduce stigma? Ah, okay. So, a couple things. One is that um, many people 
especially as you guys are well aware, in rural and remote areas, if you are a provider in a smaller small town or a uh, rural portion of your state, you uh, everybody knows uh, if there's a, a behavioral health treatment center in town. And so if people park their car outside that and other folks in town drive by, uh, everybody kind of knows each other. So the thought of going to treatment um, in a small town is concerning. Um, we also know that folks who, um, a lot of folks uh, still uh, are, by using uh, uh, drugs, um, are breaking the law. And uh, people are, a lot of times, um, resistant to talking about their uh, drug usage for fear of, of being turned in or being arrested. Um, and we all know that uh, substance use disorders certainly is a stigmatized condition. And um, although we, we're starting to see that change a bit. Um, and we think that if people can access support and help uh, using technology, using the web, that people will actually uh, seek help quicker rather than waiting for their conditions to get worse. Um, and I'll give some other examples when we're, uh, as I go further into the presentation. But it, it's still a really, and I don't need to tell all the providers out there, but we still, we still see people struggling um, about their decision uh, to seek treatment, to seek help, or to even talk to anybody uh, that they may have a uh, alcohol or drug problem. Thank you, Nancy. And there's just one more question that's come in for this portion of the program, and that's which SMS texting program are you using? Am I using? Um, I, uh, I am not a treatment provider, but I can refer you to folks who are using uh, different SMS uh, texting programs, and I can also refer you to um, several studies that demonstrate its utility. Um, and I will mention one in my presentation today, but, and you all need to know I have no stock or fiscal interest in this particular one that I'm mentioning. Um, and then if Crystal gets your name and information, I can uh, send out an article. There are several great researchers who are, uh, have got some really good results about using SMS uh, texting programs with their clients um, as a way of adding to treatment and recovery support. Perfect. Thanks so much, Nancy. Um, if you want to forward that article to me following the webinar, I'll be sure to post it with a copy of the slides and a recording of today's presentation to Iretta's right. website. And all of the attendees will get that automatically as a follow-up following the webinar today. Great. I will send you a couple. And we're working on putting together a reference list as well. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you for all the – thanks, everyone, for your questions. I really appreciate it. Okay, so there is now uh, more research out there, and there's um, actually a promise that these computerized interventions, um, we feel encouraged that technology has become mature enough to capture at least some aspects of psychotherapy. Uh, that's a great quote. So when we talk about technology-based interventions and SBIRT or SBI, so uh, screening and brief intervention or screening and brief intervention referral to treatment. What we're talking about is we're seeing technology used in two ways. One, we're seeing it as adding value to current services. Um, or, in the case of SBI and SBIRT, uh, technology could increase the frequency and quality of practitioners using uh, or implementing SBIRT in medical settings, okay? And it does that by enhancing the efficiency of it and standardizing the implementation. Because one of the complaints we hear all the time is, oh gosh, we don't have time to do another screening. 
we don't have time to do a brief intervention. But if you use technology, it may help to increase the frequency and the quality of expert use in medical settings or other healthcare settings. So, in terms of screening, uh, touchscreen devices or standalone computers with internet connections can allow patients to enter information while waiting to be seen. And then also, computer-facilitated brief intervention delivery has the potential uh, advantage of, of greater standardization, lower cost, and greater ease of implementation compared to face-to-face -face delivery. Now, technology-based uh, SBI solutions may help address the problem that this is a recent study um, that only 15.7% of the general population were asked about their alcohol usage by healthcare professionals. But there certainly uh, is evidence um, that we, uh, well, let me back up here. So um, these technology-based uh, expert solutions could be really helpful in implementing uh, SBIRT into different healthcare settings. And it could be helpful in lots of different ways, but one of the main ways is that it's that SBIRT is not being done. And that um, you can see this recent stat that only that less than a fifth of all the patients who uh, receive medical care are asked about their alcohol usage. So if the facility, if the practitioner had technology-based uh, uh, SBIRT there, it might increase uh, the screening that's done. And then uh, using a computer, there's great stats on this, using a computer to collect stigmatizing information has the potential to improve data quality by minimizing subjective bias. And we know, even though we train a lot of folks on how to do SBIRT, how to ask questions, we get a lot of folks who do things like, really, you drink a bottle of wine a night? You know, or, wow, that's a lot of alcohol you're using. So there's some uh, judgmental comments sometimes that are made. Um, people have good intentions, but sometimes our reactions come out. Um, so if we're using a computer or if we're asking patients to enter their information about their alcohol or drug use into a computer, what we're starting to see is that, that patients or people in general are a little bit more honest. Um, this was another study that was done that uh, they asked uh, folks to complete a health-related survey on a um, web-based portal so a public health uh, record into their own public health record in a, uh, a web-based portal that was private and secure. And this was at an HIV clinic. And that um, people filled it out. There wasn't any trouble. A lot of times people are like, oh, we can't ask folks about their uh, substance use because it's embarrassing. And it's like, no, you can. And that people actually will answer and that, um, if it's done sort of more anonymously, they might, you actually might get better results. Um, okay. So uh, also, well, what about uh, technology-based screening and brief intervention? So there's about 23. This is a recent uh, review done by Harrison Knight, uh, Harrison Knight, uh, 2015. And they found 23 published papers representing about 18 different trials evaluating the use of technology-based alcohol screening and brief intervention among adults, pregnant women, and adolescents in the medical setting. And all the studies found that technology-based uh, screening and brief intervention are feasible in medical settings and acceptable among patients. But a lot of the studies were not big enough, and they had some, and they didn't always have uh, randomized control, uh, and so there were some methodological limitations. Okay. Um, now, I can tell you what I'm going to go over pretty quickly, um, but I'm going to talk about a, uh, electronic SBI, or what I call web-based or online screeners. I'm going to talk about tablet-based screening. Uh, and the, the particular tablet that I'm going to be discussing is the CASI, and it has um, probably the most research behind it. 
and I'm going to highlight they have a new study out on using the CASI Spanish version and using the CASI with incarcerated males. I'm going to talk about interactive voice response or IVR. I'm going to talk about web-based expert um, and how it's being used with individuals with uh, DUIs or DWIs and with adolescents. And then I'm going to talk about text-based uh, expert used in an emergency room setting uh, with uh, young adults. And then I'm going to talk about some of the new studies that are out. So um, studies of electronic uh, SBIs, or like I call them, uh, online screeners, uh, there's, they have a, a small but significant effect size and that some users can benefit from these computer-based interventions, particularly people unlikely to seek out more traditional services. Um, when you look at the online screeners, there are a ton of them for college-age youth. Um, and there's uh, less uh, research done with uh, just the general public, but uh, two, there are two online screeners that really have a lot of evidence and support behind them. Um, and these are the Drinkers Checkup. You can see the URL address for that. Um, and Check Your Drinking. And both of these have been tested. This is, um, so the general public can go in at, and I can, I can go to this website and I can uh, do my own sort of screening uh, and uh, answer questions, and then the web-based program provides me with some feedback and a recommendation. And in some cases, will uh, we'll also uh, link me to some treatment resources if necessary. But these are the two that have the most evidence behind them besides um, several uh, online screeners that are developed specifically for uh, college-age youth. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the CASI. Uh, so the CASI is a touchscreen tablet computer that delivers the audit, the alcohol use, uh, dis uh, alcohol use disorder identification test. It's an interactive questionnaire. It operates with large icons and headphones, and it's available in both English and Spanish. There are a ton of studies on the CASI and its use in emergency departments or in primary care settings. Most of it, though, has been used, as I understand it, in um, emergency departments. Okay. The results showed that, um, this is with the CASI, that uh, two point Four or five percent of patients reported at-risk drinking to in-person screeners, to in-person folks, uh, as opposed when they used the CASI, uh, they reported a lot more use. And once again, what we talked about earlier, that seems like people seem to uh, want uh, to be more willing to disclose uh, private information. Uh, to a computer rather than to a person. And in fact, uh, the CASI has more than an eightfold higher probability of screening for at-risk alcohol use over in-person screening. So in several of these studies, they've compared using the CASI and the results they get as opposed to using a person to conduct a screening and brief intervention. Uh, also, emergency department patients were followed up, those who had used the CASI at one and six months, and uh, those uh, who participated in that uh, reported a lower alcohol consumption. Now, just to remind yourself once again, we're talking about uh, folks who are at the lower severity edge of um, their alcohol use. Now, with the Spanish CASI, uh, what they did is translate the CASI and the audit into Spanish. And uh, once again, they uh, uh, worked with uh, emergency department patients. So um, here's some data from this particular study. A higher percentage of Spanish-speaking males and females were at risk or likely or at-risk drinkers or likely dependent. 15% of Spanish-speaking patients were 
at-risk drinkers, and 5% had audit scores consistent with alcohol dependency. Spanish-speaking males exhibited higher frequency of drinking days per week and higher number of drinks uh, per day compared with females. And this study indicated that CASI was an effective tool for detecting at-risk and likely dependent uh, drinking behavior in Spanish-speaking emergency department patients. And then they also tested CASI with incarcerated males. It's a re very recent study, 2015. Um, and so here's some of the premises they based their study on. That uh, obviously, as uh, most of you know very well, that substance use disorders are overrepresented in incarcerated male populations. Um, and that cost-effective screening for alcohol and substance use problems among incarcerated populations is really necessary. And it's a first step towards intervention. But here comes the problem. How do you develop cost-effective screening strategies all right, for population-wide diffusion in a correctional setting? Um, and there's all sorts of issues, as most of you well know, about putting counselors into prisons or uh, correctional settings regarding their safety, regarding how much time they work. Um, and so when you start thinking about screening, uh, incarcerated males, you have to look at um, fiscal and staff burden uh, to be, you know, uh, sort of uh, taken on by departments of correction. And uh, as we all know, many departments of correction are facing pressures to lower their costs. But it makes sense to screen folks. We all know that it's important to screen folks to see who has the problem and who doesn't. Once we determine that, then we can determine what kind of intervention or services are need. But if we don't screen anybody uh, in prison, how do we determine that they, uh, what kind of services they do need or what kind of services they need uh, when they get out? So the study indicated that computer-assisted, the, and they used the assist on the uh, CASI, uh, was feasible among incarcerated men, even those who had very limited prior exposure to computers. And so they were worried that some of the incarcerated men who had not had a lot of experience with computers would have difficulty with uh, using the tablet. Um, and uh, they did not, and they found that it, it was as reliable as the assist interviewer administering the screening. Okay. Um, so when we look at uh, computer-assisted screening or tablet-administered screening, it really minimizes staff time and administration costs. Um, but here's the important piece. Uh, these savings are really only meaningful if clinical effectiveness is demonstrated. In other words, that we get data uh, about a person and their level of problem, and then we can design treatment services after that. So cost-effective screening really seeks to efficiently screen for a treatable condition while maximizing the number of people that, that you can accurately identify as needing the treatment for a particular condition especially substance use disorder. So they used the CASI in um, prison settings and in this particular study, and they found it usable and effective, and that uh, the men who were incarcerated there also had very little difficulty using uh, the tablet. So, I'm Oh, hi, on. Nancy. Okay. Um, before we move on to the next um, modality you're going to talk about. We did have a question come in about the CASI, so I thought now would be as good a time as any to pause for a couple of questions. Okay. Um, the question is, in the Lost to Poor et al. study from 2013 with the CASI, is it possible that the psychometrics of the CASI were poor, which created more false positives? Um, the person who submitted the question is not familiar with CASI in particular, but was wondering if it may have created a higher result. You know, that's a really, that's a really good question, and I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure whether it could have done that or not. I think um, a lot of the studies that we are seeing says that um, people seem to feel more comfortable uh, disclosing their behaviors, their drug and alcohol use, um, to, not to a person and rather doing that online and that they felt it was uh, 
uh, more secure. Now, I don't know if the psychrom I don't think the psychrometric, I think basically what the CASI has done is they've just taken the audit or the assist and uh, put it uh, in a web-based format uh, for use on a tablet. I know there's some, sometimes there's difficulties in the articles I read that some uh, folks need help but not from a clinician, it could be from um, like an aide or something uh, to answer the skip patterns. Um, so, um, so there's skip patterns that say, you know, uh, if you answer a particular question that way and you say no, then you have to move on to the next question and sometimes people got a little confused about moving, how to move on to the next question with the skip pattern. I can um, uh, I can uh, contact the author of the study to ask that particular question. But what we do see is a theme of people in general seem to feel more comfortable uh, disclosing private health information um, to uh, to a computer, or to a website, rather than to a person. Now, with uh, there's no, on the flip side, uh, in uh, one of the studies I just read, is that we see adolescents being a little bit more suspicious, although they like uh, using, you know, uh, being sort of a drug and alcohol history or, or use uh, description uh, online. They're also they will also ask more questions like, how is this protected? who's getting this information, who will have access to this information. Great. Um, and one more question for now. Um, does the tablet also supply the intervention, or does it just do the screening? Uh, there's different um, versions. Um, some have, <clears throat> uh, some do just the, the screening, and some include the brief intervention. And I'll talk about um, so uh, in most cases, uh, uh, the CASI will give some feedback back to the person, um, but not a full-blown brief intervention. But I'll talk about uh, some of the expert-based uh, techn uh, technology interventions that focus more on the brief intervention piece. Perfect. Thanks so much, Nancy. OK. So let's talk about interactive voice response. And a lot of people are like, what? I've never heard of this. Um, but it's a telephone-based technology, and it uses touchstone phones to enable the caller to interact with a computer using the telephone keypad as the interface. And really, uh, it's cool. The IVR is an auditory interactive process. It's not hampered by people having to read or understand the language. Um, and there's privacy, uh, it seems to be greater with IVR because it's not on a computer screen, it's not a written questionnaire. So basically what it is, is they have uh, downloaded into a computer system, uh, they've downloaded like the, um, oh, let's say the audit, and they have uh, put it into a computer-based system, linked it to telephones. So what I would do is I would call in, and then I would follow a, a series of uh, commands and answer different questions, either using my voice or using the telephone keypad. And um, it's kind of like trying to pay a bill online, uh, trying to access some kind of problem. All of us have um, either had horrible experiences or good experiences trying to um, use the telephone to, to solve problems. This is an interesting uh, way of doing uh, SBI. Uh, the hardware and software is centrally housed in an IVR system, and it can support multiple clinical sites. There's no online installation cost beyond uh, telephone access. And what we see, uh, a lot of times, these are used in primary care uh, clinics. Um, and so what happens is that while the patient is waiting, they can um, 
go in waiting to see the physician, nurse practitioner, uh, physician assistant. They can go to a private area, and there are several telephones set up, um, and folks go in and answer questions or uh, an, uh, either with their voice or keypad of the phone, and then that information will be documented and then uh, given to the physician, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant um, before the patient goes into uh, the exam room and then uh, the doctor can use uh, feedback. The other thing is that some of these uh, IVR uh, responses or systems have also developed a brief intervention piece that folks can do online. And also, they provide a resource that people after hours can go in and listen to different modules about uh, cutting down on your drinking, uh, how to say no. Uh, this particular study, what they found was that they made the telephone line and the telephone number avail available to patients. And that many of the patients called the IVR brief intervention line outside of clinic hours to listen to uh, the different modules. And so what was neat about it is that this particular IVR system used the screening piece and then they also offered the brief intervention um, and that and then the, uh, also offered uh, different modules for clients to call in and listen to again. And so it produced greater exposure to needed advice and information after hours, which is just fascinating to uh, think about. Um, I'm going to move on to texting. This is a uh, a uh, new study that was done, it's called TRACK. It's texting to reduce alcohol uh, consumption. It's done by uh, Brian Cefaletto and his colleagues out of uh, Pittsburgh. And they say, why should you text message? Well, there are certainly competing priorities of practitioners. There's competing priorities of patients. It's, uh, you know, it's really difficult to uh, get behavioral health support outside of the healthcare environment, um, that uh, SMS texting programs now are pretty uh, easy to, to uh, use. Uh, everybody seems to know how to text. Uh, texting is available even for folks who have the um, track phones. It's really a low burden, and it's pretty uh, conversational. In other words, people can uh, text back, and it's almost like somebody's checking on you, which can be a, uh, seen as certainly support. Um, this is what uh, Brian and his group did. And if you ever get a chance to see Brian speak, he's a great speaker, and, and I hope I'm doing uh, him justice by going over his study. So I call it kind of like the brief intervention or the I intervention of effort. Uh, so on November 1st through uh, 2012 through November 5th, 2013, they worked with four different emergency departments in Pittsburgh. Uh, they got 765 participants to agree. These were emergency, uh, these are young adults, 18 to 25 years of age, who had come into the emergency department for medical services, not necessarily alcohol or drug related services, just for uh, emergency treatment services. Um, they screened them uh, in person using uh, the audit and uh, uh, on average uh, the uh, women who agreed to participate had scores greater than three, audit scores, C scores greater than three for women, greater four for men. Um, they excluded uh, 18 to 25 year olds who had had a past treatment for drugs or alcohol related problems, and they include and they excluded uh, folks who had uh, been treated for a psychiatric disorder. Um, and what they asked the uh, patients, 18 to 25 year olds, to do was to uh, agree to be involved in a 12 week uh, interactive uh, text. Uh, messaging intervention. And then they randomized them into three groups. They randomized them into a group that got no text messaging. Uh, they put them in another group where they got text messaging after the weekend. 
and then they put them in a group that got uh, text messaging before the weekend and then after the weekend. So they had three different groups. And so um, the folks that got the pre-weekend, um, so one of their theories are it was adult, uh, 18, young adults, 18 to 25 year old weekends are high risk for uh, binge drinking. And so they uh, included weekends, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and they would, part of their SMS uh, texting system would uh, text the patient and say, what's your plan for this weekend? Are you planning to drink? And the patient would text back, no, I'm not planning to drink. And so then they would give them an abstinence support message. Or if the patient said, yeah, I'm planning to drink, then you say, are you planning to binge? No, I'm not planning to binge. And they defined what binge drinking was. And so then no plan to uh, uh, binge. They would also then get great support. And then if you plan to binge, can you set a goal? And will you set a goal, uh, yes or no? Um, and then what's your goal? Um, and then, so they did this on Thursday. And then on Sunday, with the group uh, that got the Thursday message. They also uh, got a Sunday message like drinking recall. So how'd you do? How many drinks did you have? Did you, uh, if you drank in, in, in a binge-like fashion, you got high-risk feedback. If you drank without binging, you got low-risk feedback. And then um, you got abstinence feedback support if you reported no uh, drinking. The interesting piece is the other group, uh, intervention group, got just the post-weekend Sunday uh, uh, call, and te or should, I should say text, and uh, their response. Now, um, they had, uh, this intervention had great effect at three months, six months, uh, nine months, and 12 months. We, uh, the interesting piece was that uh, the folks that were involved in the um, texting uh, where they got the Thursday inquiry and text, you know, like, what's your plan, how much you're going to drink, how, you know, all those types of things, and, and the folks that got the post, so they got the both interventions did the best, and they decreased uh, the amount that they were binge drinking um, at three months, six months and nine months, and it was statistically significant. Um, also, the folks that did um, the, uh, got just the Sunday night texting, they also decreased their uh, binge drinking, and the control stayed um, about, about the same. Um, and so what they found is that it is, it, it's really, uh, the results of the particular study really demonstrated that it was this—it was the Thursday intervention that seemed to make the most sense. The texting, the texting intervention that seemed to make the most sense. So it would be like, man, you know, I need to—I um, need to think about what I'm going to do and about my behavior and how can I make a plan. Uh, not to drink as much and to cut down on my drinking. That, and that's according to the research study. Very interesting. Um, they have started to commercialize this partic particular uh, SMS texting program, and it's called Caring Text. Uh, Donald Taylor, PhD, MBA, is the chief executive officer. I, I don't know how much it costs. Um, it's through uh, health uh, strategic. I don't know. I don't know how to say the last piece. You can see the logo in the um, slide. But that's just one example. And certainly, this is like the brief. This is like the brief intervention piece um, of expert for texting. And with this particular group, we know 18 to 25 year olds are really uh, at risk for binge drinking which brings not only health issues, which impacts not only health issues, but certainly impacts uh, things like unwanted pregnancies, STDs, accidents, uh, fighting, arrest, 
uh, making dumb choices, those type of things. So I'm going to move on and talk about web-based screening. I have two examples for you. Um, the first is a new study that was done on web-based screening for folks with uh, DUIs or uh, DWIs. Um, from the article, it says most DWI offenders, they're not screened. Um, and they're not screened for alcohol-related problems until after adjudication, so after they go to court, which can take months or even years. And so what happens is that if folks are not screened it, um, until after adjudication, until they're sentenced, uh, what happens is that uh, they continue to uh, drink or drug, and so their identification as having a particular, of having a substance use disorder uh, doesn't happen. And so what they're recommending is that alcohol use screening could be provided in pretrial services. Uh, they tested this out, and pretrial services in many uh, jurisdictions are orientation sessions, uh, and it might be a great uh, moment to engage offenders in their own treatment and recovery process. The pretrial services provide supervision in many cases of offenders prior to their sentencing, and the supervision process starts soon after release from custody for the offense. Uh, in this particular study, they developed a self-guided uh, web-based screening tool. They named it Motivational Alcohol Treatment to Enhance Roadway Safety or MATTERS. Um, and they would assess alcohol use characteristics, and then it generates the web-based program, uh, generates a personalized feedback report. The interesting piece in this is that then the staff took that feedback report and then delivered a manualized uh, brief motivational intervention and provided a referral to treatment in person. So they combined the use of a technology with um, using a technology to do screening, and then uh, the web-based program came up with a profile or a feedback report, and then uh, the pre-service staff took that, and then they delivered a manualized brief uh, intervention. And basically, the study found that uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, that clients were uh, amenable to it, and it helped get folks into to identify folks who had uh, substance use dependence um, and get them into treatment uh, quicker rather than waiting uh, for sentencing. This next one are two studies for adolescents, and it's really a brief intervention. So, um, and they compared an in-person uh, brief intervention with a uh, technology-based uh, intervention, brief intervention. And so these were adolescents in the Cunningham study that were uh, in the uh, emergency room. They reported drinking in the past 12 months. Um, no, excuse me. Cunningham's was in primary care offices, and Walton's was in emergency departments. And so um, they did uh, in-person screening. Um, and you can see, uh, and, uh, and then they compared that to uh, in-person brief intervention versus a technology-based uh, intervention. So the latter two trials additionally compared a single session computer-delivered brief intervention with a therapist-delivered version that was similar in content. Okay. So um, for Cunningham, the brief intervention, they found that their computerized and therapist delivered brief interventions, which addressed peer violence and alcohol use, were associated with greater reductions in alcohol-related consequences, such as missing school because of alcohol use, and compared with patients receiving the standard controlled care. By the 12-month follow-up, patients receiving the therapist delivered brief intervention maintained reductions in peer violence, but neither intervention continued to influence alcohol-related uh, outcomes. That was at 12 months. Uh, Walton's study looked at 836 urban adolescent uh, emergency department patients with risky drinking. Uh, those receiving either uh, brief interventions significantly increased their perception that it was important to stop drinking compared with adolescents receiving standard care. 
Those receiving the therapist-delivered intervention increase their readiness to stop drinking. Within the computer-delivered intervention, brief intervention, the components that most influenced outcomes were those that helped patients identify more benefits of behavior change, imagine sports activities that could be alternatives to alcohol use, and to choose a goal or to reduce or stop drinking. So um, these were two studies that were done, uh, and the focus was comparing uh, therapist-driven uh, uh, um, or delivered uh, brief interventions versus um, computer-based brief interventions with adolescents, uh, adolescents in emergency departments uh, who came in for care versus adolescents in primary care. And so you can see that in some cases, the computer-based intervention did fairly well, um, and in other cases, the therapist-delivered brief intervention uh, did well in other areas. And it's, this year, these are two interesting studies because they're starting to tease out the difference between a computer-driven intervention versus a therapist-driven intervention and the differences. Um, these are also other uh, new studies on technology-based effort. Uh, I'm just going to highlight them. You can see they came out in 2015. Uh, their uh, computer self-administered self screening, expert screening for substance use in a university health center, a feasibility pilot that was done in 2015, and then Another study done on how digital interventions on screening brief intervention could be applied to psychiatric emergency department settings. And then interactive empathic video enhanced and computer delivered SBI, ESBI, plus three tailored mailings and estimated intervention effects for pregnant women. This is the work of uh, Anders Lana. And he's done some work with postpartum women and uh, using technology-based interventions for women who postpartum are using cannabis. This is for pregnant women. And it's a really nice inter interactive, empathic, video-enhanced, computer-delivered SBI. And then the uh, patients also receive three tailored ma uh, mailings, meaning three uh, educational-based mailings, uh, newsletters type of thing that helps support not drinking during pregnancy. Um, and then they estimated the intervention effects for pregnant women and found some uh, really positive results with this initial study. Um, so let me summarize. Or I can take some questions before I summarize. Uh, Crystal, let me know what's most appropriate. Sure, we've had a couple more questions come in, and the first one is, what is the approximate cost of the CASI IVR and SMS texting? I know you might not have that off the top of your head, Nancy, so if you need to refer some more resources, we can certainly get those to people after the webinar. I think, uh, you know, I think I'm going to have to uh, look up the cost. Oh, now, here's the dilemma with the technology-based interventions, whether it's for expert or whether it's uh, treatment-oriented or support-oriented. Um, the research is just uh, getting strong enough. Um, and what's happened as well is that folks, uh, the clinician, that researchers are not marketers or, or developers of uh, uh, or being a, they don't do well in selling their their product, and so you can see with um, Brian Sofleto his uh, work on track. Now it has a commercial sort of they have sort of it's been commercialized. Um, I can tell you in some cases that um, we know of systems going for like ten thousand dollars for systems. We know system. We know other systems are. Uh, they have different packages. So if you want to do SMS texting with, let's say, uh, a thousand clients, it will be one price. If it's 500 clients, it's less than that. Depends on the ex uh, how extensive the texting is going to be. Um, but Crystal, I can try and get back to folks regarding different programs that are available. Um, 
I just I just don't have the CAFI cost in front of me right now or the other cost. Not a problem. Um, has the track been used with individuals other than college-aged individuals? Not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, the, the theory that they base it on um, this particular text program, texting program, is um, that it's helpful for people to get reminders about um, their drinking intentions. And um, we see some sort of low-cost uh, responses to that as well. So that I know a few um, counselors, therapists, um, social workers are helping their clients put into their phones. If they have smartphones, it's a lot easier. If they don't, if they have track phones, but sort of um, reminders so they can uh, send themselves a text message that says, remember you agreed to um, only have one drink tonight. Um, and so they're doing sort of this low cost version of SMS texting with their clients. Now the counselors are not sending out the text messages. It's the counselors working with the clients to put these kind of messages on their own phones or to look at uh, different uh, apps that are available for uh, those purposes where people can uh, download an app. You have to be real careful about privacy and security. So if you pay for the app, uh, you're going to have a little bit more privacy. But uh, drink counters, in other words, you can enter how many drinks you've had so that you can you can count over a week's period of time. You get a better count um, of how much, how many drinks you've had. Okay, we've had a couple more questions come in, but I can see we're getting close to the end time for the webinar, and I do want to give you some time to summarize and share the rest of your presentation, Nancy. So what I will do is keep track of the questions, and I will send them out to you after the webinar, and then we'll follow up with the answers and a follow-up email to the attendees. OK, great. So let me summarize. What we know is that technology-based interventions for SVIRT or SBI are feasible, and that patients are interested in using them, and that there's initial studies that are demonstrating positive outcomes. All right, um, and that um, technology-based interventions for SBIRT can help healthcare and other settings with implementation of SBIRT or SBI, um, and that technology-based interventions can encourage patient, patients' disclosure of alcohol and drug usage, and in some cases, people are saying more accurately or authentically, and um, also, in some cases, provide more extensive brief intervention services. So for example, uh, the TRAC study, that was done over 12 weeks. Patients agreed to participate. The ones in the uh, uh, intervention group got these supportive text messages and got text messages about what's your plan for this weekend, about drinking and all of that. And so the brief intervention goes longer than just the first like an hour or 20 minutes of a medical appointment. So there's some interesting kinds of things there that seem to be working fairly well. So is it a time for new technology? I think it's a time for us to uh, be open about the use of technology, to look at the research literature, to talk with other providers who are using this particular, these pr uh, particular technologies that are available, and then looking at the cost. What we know right now is that insurance companies are not reimbursing um, for technology-based interventions, so it's more of a value-added uh, kind of effect for providers. The other piece is many providers are being assessed to make sure that they're using evidence-based practices if you're using a technology-based intervention that uses, let's say, CBT, you can always point to that particular technology-based intervention saying, yes, we are using evidence-based practice. Here's an example of what we're using because the technology-based intervention delivers the, uh, 
intervention uh, in, uh, and it's congruent with um, the uh, evidence-based practice. The other thing is, is that we know, uh, for example, uh, there's an app done by the University of Wisconsin uh, called HS. They have applied for their app to be considered a medical device. And so then it could be reimbursable uh, by uh, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, what I also want to say is that clients and consumers are already uh, embracing technology and creating this patient-centered health movement where I'm going to have much more say-so in how I manage my health and how I get support. Um, and certainly what we think is that technology-based interventions are most effective when, compi when combined with human support and professional treatment services because they reinforce you know, that providers will, you know, and this reinforces that providers will remain the foundation of care for those seeking help. So it's not just technology-based interventions alone. It's technology-based interventions with trained professional staff that will certainly help make the difference. Uh, I want to thank you all. We, I certainly hope that you fill out the feedback form. Um, and I want to do a little bit of promotion of things that we have uh, at our website, National Frontier and Rural ATTC, uh, org. Um, so we have a course called New Ethical Dilemmas in the Digital Age. We have one on technology-based uh, clinical supervision, uh, recovery support technology, and our newest curriculum is Implementing Technology-Assisted Care into Behavioral Health Settings. You can contact us and request any of these trainings. It does not cost you a dime. Uh, it's part of the work we do. You can see on this particular slide uh, how to reach us, how to get to our website. And on the website, you can say request a training. Or certainly, you can go through our colleagues at the National Expert ATTC. We all work together. Um, we also have a telehealth capacity assessment tool. This tool helps you assess your agency. Uh, to see if you're ready to adopt telehealth technologies or technology-based interventions. Um, our last thing I want to promote is in Philadelphia this year, August 3rd through the 5th, we're having our fourth annual technology summit. It does not cost anything to attend. Uh, and we're going to be, we have a whole panel on uh, technology-based uh, interventions regarding SMS texting. We have experts coming in to talk about uh, their research results and what people can do. We have another breakout session on uh, privacy and security issues regarding, regarding emailing and texting patients uh, just re uh, uh, for administrative purposes. We have a, a breakout session on video conferencing, how to, use, how to do uh, uh, individual or group counseling online and some of the issues and, and uh, that go along with that and how to start that up. Um, and then we have a telephone-based re recovery support uh, breakout session as well. We have lots of folks attending and uh, you can certainly go to our website and register. You can see it says nfarsummit.com. So uh, I want to thank uh, Crystal and Holly Hagel and the uh, Esper ATTC for giving this, giving us this opportunity to uh, be on the webinar, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have any time left. Thank you, Nancy. We really appreciate you coming on and doing such a great presentation for us. We've gotten a lot of really great, great questions, but I just want to take some time to go over the evaluation and CEU instructions. We will definitely get answer to those questions for you guys, and I will send them out after the webinar, because um, you will be receiving a few emails from us. 